what's going on TV land. I'm Abby Martin, and this is Breaking the Set. So, last week, the State Department released an environmental impact report stating that the southern leg of the Keystone XL pipeline will have an insignificant impact on carbon emissions. But even if this report gives Obama the green light to move forward, one group is refusing to allow the construction of Keystone. Native American communities, including the Oglala Sioux, just released a statement entitled, No Keystone XL Pipeline Will Cross Lakota Lands. The Lakota Nation, as well as other tribes from Oklahoma to Oregon, have banded together to plan on how they will take direct action. Yes, it looks like Obama now has America's indigenous community to worry about if he does approve this toxic project. So if you believe that this destructive pipeline has no business crossing through Native American territory, then join me and let's break the set. It was a terrible mistake, and we're working very hard to make it up for it. And once again, we put something on the air. It's a flat-out lie. Have you ever had sex with Governor Rick Perry? No, wait. Do not answer that. I want you to watch what we're about to do, because you've never seen anything like this on television. My next guest is someone who has shattered the two-party monopoly after winning a seat on Seattle's city council. What makes her unique is that she's the first socialist to be elected to public office in decades. Her name is Shama Sawant, and she continues to make headlines as a critical voice in the Fight for 15 movement, a campaign to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Sawant so joined me earlier to talk about this campaign and her political career. But considering how running third party usually means a political death sentence, I first asked her why she chose to do so. Look at the silence that has been ended on economic inequality, on the injustices of the bailouts of the big banks uh, through the Occupy movement. People are looking for alternatives to the political dysfunction of the two parties of big business. They are looking for alternatives for the systemic failure that has generated enormous poverty, enormous social and economic injustice, at the same time that big business and the super wealthy are growing wealthier at historically high proportions. And so uh, actually, on the contrary, this, this not being a death sentence, this is actually a huge opening for the left to build its forces, to build mass movements, and to recognize that people are ready and getting ready to move into struggle. Well, your campaign is definitely proof that socialist ideals do resonate with people. Why do you think there's such a concerted effort to shut down and demonize socialism by the corporate media? Well, I think it's clear why the uh, corporate media wants to demonize. You know, there's been a whole uh, decades of uh, 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 stigmatizing the ideas of socialism and you know a lot of that has to do with the former Soviet Union the bureaucratic dictatorship which you know suddenly I, I'm not advocating for you know we are as socialist alternative advocating for democratic socialism meaning the society being run democratically in the interests of all working people on the planet all the children or everybody who has needs and all of that being done in an environmentally sustainable manner. So whether somebody calls themselves socialist or not, this is a rational need. Everybody recognizes my family needs economic security. I need a, a decent housing that's affordable. Uh, I need good job. My, uh, my partner needs good jobs. My children need access to good education. And when a broad swath of people recognize that the system is not providing for them, and instead, increasing the gap, wealth gap and advantage gap, obviously people are moving into, uh, you know, thinking that, you know, this is, this is not working, we need something different, what can that be? And so when that sort of questioning starts to arise, that's a threat to the ruling class, that's a threat to big business, to big corporations, and to the two-party establishment, and so it, you know, they are going to make attempts to shut it down. Mm. Well, we definitely saw what a threat the Occupy movement was to the establishment, federalized crackdowns, administered from the top down. 
Shama, your pivotal advocate for the fight for the 15 campaign, a push to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. But Obama's proposal to increase the minimum wage to just $10 an hour is generating a lot of opposition from people who say that it would hurt small businesses and the economy. How do you respond and also defend the fight for 15? So the fight for 15, as you correctly said, yes, that is now the epicenter of political struggle uh, all around the United States. And, you know, Seattle is now, uh, you know, showing the way. And, and in fact, I would mention that uh, SeaTac, the SeaTac initiative, SeaTac is a neighboring city to Seattle. They've already passed a ballot initiative that voters voted for. They voted in $15 an hour. So clearly there is uh, political momentum on the grassroots for this to happen. And as far as Obama's uh, executive order for $10 and 10 cents for future contract workers for federal, you know, federal uh, contract companies, I would say that any step forward is a welcome uh, development. However, $10 and 10 cents is not a ticket out of poverty, as I've said before. And also, for those who say that any increase in minimum wage is going to shut down small businesses, I, we have to be bold and you know, audacious in reminding people that in reality, capitalism is not a system that favors small businesses. Small business, businesses, as somebody else has said, are like squirrels dancing in the middle of elephants. The, and, and you know, corporations, big corporations, they dominate the economic landscape, not small businesses. So if people genuinely want to support small businesses, they have to recognize that the interests of small businesses and working people often go hand in hand, and they are both getting beaten down by the recession. And uh, increasing the minimum wage will actually be a step forward for small businesses. And I would go even further. I would say that the minimum wage le legislations that we put forth in Seattle and elsewhere, they should include uh, um, clauses that make uh, small businesses make it possible for them to pay $15 an hour to their employees and put the burden on corporations who are now paying historically low taxes. Your campaign took no donations from big business, speaking of big business, solely relied on small donors. Amazing, an amazing feat. It's certainly an anomaly in a political system that's so dysfunctional and where money is speech. Do you think that what you've done can really be replicated across the country? You know, if you look at Seattle, certainly it has certain unique features, but I would say there are unique features for every city. What is not unique and what is all-encompassing nationally is the rapid decline in living standards for the majority of the people, for the 99%. You see a never-ending race to the bottom. Youth especially are looking into an abyss of low-wage jobs, student debt, and just a really bleak future. So everywhere there is a seeking of uh, alternatives. And in Seattle, Socialist Alternative has won the election for city council. We also ran a campaign in Minneapolis where Ty Moore ran as a candidate. He's been a longtime uh, activist in the, in the Occupy Homes campaign, and he came very close to winning. So I think the conditions for the left, for alternatives to Democrats and Republicans to build their forces exist. The question is, are we going to take advantage of that? And I would say that we don't even need to speculate. Look at the evidence already. A year ago, nobody was talking about $15 an hour. People were making fun of us. Political pundits you know, wrote a number of articles on how out of touch we were. But look at, look at us now. $15 an hour is at the top of the political agenda, not just in Seattle, but nationally. You have the White House talking about it. Why is this? That's because they're facing the heat from the grassroots, and that's why our primary task is not only to run independent candidates, but also to build mass movements, and that's what we're doing in Seattle. We're, uh, you know, we've launched the 15now.org campaign, so I would urge all your viewers to check out 15now.org and become a part of that. Well, I like what you said about this is a reflection of reality, because it really is. Anyone who's worked in the service industry certainly knows that. Um, but the best the left has in congressional representations, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, I mean, Yet the right seems to be fully represented. <laughs> what do you think is the root of this disproportionality? Is it just that the left is bad at winning politically on that level? I think primarily uh, that can be attributed to the fact that progressives, liberals, left, you know, whatever label people choose for themselves, for decades have uh, bought into this idea that you can't build outside the Democratic Party. And if you want to be successful in pushing for socially just causes uh, and for economic justice, and you have to work within the Democratic Party establishment. I would say the same thing about Elizabeth Warren. I mean, I really admire the woman, but I seriously doubt what could be accomplished within the Democratic Party establishment, because regardless of your own uh, 
commitment to social justice. If you are serving the Democratic Party, then you are serving the interests of big business. Look at Goldman Sachs. Look at the uh, historically high contributions Obama got from them and from other big banks, the same banks that were responsible for the financial collapse. So the main task of the left is to recognize that that is not a channel for any social change, and that step for social change requires requires the left, requires the labor movement to recognize that we can't, this is a failed strategy, you know, this is an abusive relationship that we've been stuck in for decades with the Democratic Party. Look at the amount amount of money and the number of foot soldiers the labor movement provides for every election for the Democratic Party. And what have we got out of it? We have got a long-term assault on labor unions. The right. sooner we wake up to this and the sooner we wake up to the fact that there is an openness to independent politics, the better our results will be. Even though your campaign does resonate with many, I think a lot of people still have this Cold War mentality. They think socialism equals communism equals tyranny. I mean, even though we employ socialist concepts in this country and across Europe, how do you get people to disarm from this narrow perspective? I think that's true that, you know, we've, you, we're sort of just coming out from under the wake of the Cold War propaganda. But in reality, I would say that a lot of young people, and I mean, anywhere from their teens to early 40s, you know, a lot of people are actually waking up to the, uh, all the, just the complete failures of the capitalist system to solve even the basic problems of poverty and access to, you know, basic needs. And so they are actually uh, stepping outside of that whole realm and uh, trying to see what else could be possible. So in fact, if you look at the recent Pew Research poll, it shows that young people are more favorable to socialism than to capitalism, and there is an openness to look at alternatives. And I would say that uh, there's another aspect to this openness, and that's the question of the environment. So especially if you look at young people radicalizing around environmental issues, it is becoming more and more clear to them that the Democratic Party and capitalism are, uh, or the Republican Party, you know, that whole, that whole system is, uh, is completely dysfunctional, not working. And in fact, uh, when, you know, when we made our so State of the Union response, a lot of people uh, gave us this feedback that, you know, Obama's speech did not even mention Keystone XL, mm -hmm. did not mention the question of uh, fracking. And it's so empty, it's an empty rhetoric to be talking about climate change when you are overseeing an administration that has actually promoted fracking, promoted the use of these destructive practices that are actually going to be, uh, you know, ultimately leading us in a regressive way towards climate change. And so I think that all of this, all of these economic, environmental, and social questions are converging in people's minds, and they're really crystallizing and blossoming into a deep questioning of society itself. Shama Sawan, city council member, city of Seattle, really appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much for having me. Coming up, I talked to Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Chris Hedges. Stick around. are force-fed. Six explosions near the finish line of the Boston Marathon. More than a thousand people have gathered. What is the latest that you're hearing about the number of victims? <laughs> Thank you.
breaking the set recently took a trip to Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Pine Ridge is one of the poorest counties in the U.S., and the conditions there are comparable to developing countries. This is partly why Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and social critic Chris Hedges has referred to places like Pine Ridge as capitalism's sacrifice zones. However, this systemic subjugation is as old as civilization itself. Earlier today, Chris joined me to talk about the roots of institutionalized inequality and reasons behind the collapse of complex societies. I first asked him why places like Pine Ridge are so susceptible to such extreme poverty. These are places where uh, unfettered capitalist forces backed by force uh, on behalf of the railroad companies, uh, timber merchants, uh, the, the people who profited from decimating the buffalo herds, um, uh, mining concerns, came in and seized the land of Native Americans and uh, killed most of them. Uh, and not only that, but after herding them into what in essence were prisoner of war camps, set out to destroy their culture, uh, their religion, their language. It's why uh, Indian children were taken from their parents and put in Christian boarding schools where they were not allowed, for instance, in Pine Ridge to speak Lakota. Mm. And uh, what's happening now with uh, the late end of the industrial age and uh, capitalism is that uh, the reservation, that uh, environment that uh, uh, Native American people have endured and suffered under uh, is being extended, uh, growing in, in greater and greater uh, areas, uh, you know, we're all being sacrificed as the uh, residents of Charleston, West Virginia, were sacrificed when their water was poisoned uh, by coal company. It's still poisoned, although they've been told to drink it. People, children are coming home from school sick. Um, this is not something that is unknown to uh, Native Americans. And I think that whole demented project of ceaseless exploitation, expansion, and violence, the template of that was set. Uh, in the westward expansion. You discuss how the world is globally integrated under an unsustainable form of capitalism, but America positions itself atop the totem pole justified by the notion of American exceptionalism. How do you think that that notion plays into the global collapse? Well, corporations are preying on the United States in the way that they prey on all nation states. They are, in this essence, supranational. They owe no loyalty to any one nation. Uh, and that's how you have seen the decimation of the American manufacturing base. That is how you have seen the transference of capital uh, overseas, where it, it lies beyond the reach of taxation. Uh, you have seen the rise, uh, the decimation of the working class, and the rise of tremendous numbers of poor, uh, whether they're uh, listed as in poverty or a category called near poverty. We're now talking about half the country, um, and uh, the myth of America is still there. Uh, the idea that if you work hard, you can make something of yourself, the idea that we have a right to travel the globe and impose our virtues, the supposed virtues, on other countries by force, which is what we are doing, attempting to do throughout the Middle East, although it's not going very well for us. Uh, but uh, look, uh, you know, imperialism has always been a mask for trade for business, uh, for control of natural resources. Uh, that is true, uh, uh, has been true since the United States uh, began its imperialist expansion with the uh, conquest of the Philippines, Cuba, uh, the control of the Caribbean uh, for sugar, uh, bananas uh, uh, into the Middle East for the control of oil. Uh, so what we're seeing is a kind of clash between the myth that America uh, once uh, used to identify itself, and let's not uh, forget that you know uh, many of the most fervent supporters of imperialist expansion came from labor unions. Uh, I mean, Gompers was at the, the Versailles Treaty. Uh, I mean, the, the, all segments of the society are complicit. But these forces, uh, uh, the, which, uh, which in essence kind of cannibalize uh, both the natural environment and uh, exploit human labor uh, and have been doing this on the outer reaches of empire for decades have, are now being done internally, uh, just as uh, it was done in the uh, original 
uh, conquest of the United States uh, against Native Americans. You talk about the impending environmental catastrophes and also severe economic uncertainty on the horizon. Why do you think there's no sense of urgency on a large scale to address these troubling trends? Well, because they're not reported. Uh, the commercial media is about bread and circus. It's about spectacle. It's about celebrity gossip. It's about the Super Bowl. Uh, I mean, every week it's something new. Uh, and uh, you know, if we had a responsible media, especially a broadcast media, we would understand that climate change at this point is uh, an emergency. Uh, that. Uh, you know, at this point, the effects of climate change are unstoppable. Um, uh, and if we don't uh, radically reconfigure our relationship with the ecosystem very, very quickly, uh, the human species itself is in jeopardy. And uh, you can look at the World Bank uh, report on climate change, uh, turn up the heat. The World Bank can hardly be accused of being a radical organization. And they speak at the end of that report in utterly apocalyptic terms. So, uh, you know, scientists, um, uh, especially people who study climate change, they know very well what's happening, and yet we're not hearing their voices. We are mesmerized by electronic hallucinations, uh, and that's, of course, how corporations want it. Uh, when 40 percent of the summer Arctic sea ice melts, uh, companies, corporations like Shell Oil look at the death throes of our planet as a business opportunity and they're run up and drop half billion dollar drill bits down into the Arctic Sea. Um, the, uh, the, I think what we have seen is um, uh, a kind of iron control of the systems of information by corporate power who are determined to exploit and exploit and exploit until uh, collapse. Uh, and, and now we're, of course, about to see, in all likelihood, the president approve the northern leg of the Keystone or XL mm -hmm. pipeline. So um, it's an uninformed public. It's a public which has been uh, diverted. Their emotional and intellectual uh, energy has been invested into spectacle, um, uh, coupled with a, a kind of ruthless corporate totalitarianism uh, that thinks only in terms of quarterly profit uh, and has absolutely no concern for the, uh, not only the common good, but the very sustenance of uh, the ecosystem that uh, might provide uh, some kind of uh, decent uh, and acceptable living standards for future generations. Uh, Chris, but on the flip side, you've also said that as collapse becomes palpable, humanity will retreat in what anthropologists call crisis cults. What is a crisis called, and why does our psychological hardwiring always revert back to these modes of groupthink? Well, when things become so desperate, uh, you retreat, or human societies retreat, uh, into forms of magical thinking. Uh, at the end of the uh, uh, Indian Wars uh, and the latter part of the 19th century, you saw the rise of the ghost dance. Uh, uh, which swept through the remnants of native communities. Uh, these communities believed that uh, the great spirit, the warriors, would come back. Uh, uh, it, the buffalo herds would come back. Um, they would get their lands back. Uh, the white colonizer would disappear. Um, that is replicated, I mean, as anthropologists have studied, uh, throughout societies that collapse. Now, we, we, the way we express our crisis cult is through the radical Christian right. Um, again, a form of magical thinking uh, which denies evolution, which believes in the rapture that uh, those believers when Jesus returns will be raptured up into heaven. Um, that's a classic example of uh, a crisis cult. So that when things become desperate, uh, you gather in a church, you pray, you carry out Christian ritual, you tend to uh, lash out at a society to purge, you see it in the rhetoric. Uh, you know, whether it's against homosexuals, whether it's against undocumented workers, Muslims, a long list of contaminants uh, that will somehow make the society right. Um, all of that has within it the makings of a crisis cult. But crisis cults are, are what societies do uh, when uh, despair reaches such a level, and we're certainly headed in that direction, uh, when you are unable in any real way to affect the environment or the world around you, then 
um, then you wrap yourself in these cocoons of fantasy. Mm. In the article, The Myth of Human Progress, you write in reference to truth that people, quote, get as close as they can before the flames and heat drive them back. The intellectual and moral honesty, Nietzsche wrote, comes with a cost. Those singed by the fire of reality become burnt children, he wrote, eternal orphans and empires of illusion. Chris, if this is the way it's always worked and those who seek truth are constantly ostracized, is humanity just doomed to be subject to empires of illusion? Well, I'm quoting Nietzsche there uh, about, uh, you know, looking down that mm -hmm. only artists and philosophers have the capacity to look into what he calls the court of molten pit of reality. And when they come back out, um, they find that the wider populace, which is unable to look, can't deal with it. Uh, and so I depart a little bit from Nietzsche there. Nietzsche, like Plato, says that you create uh, illusions, myth, in order to uh, explain uh, a reality or help people cope with a reality. Uh, unfortunately, the role of truth tellers in uh, distraught or disturbed societies, um, uh, and we have our own examples of that, whether it's Noam Chomsky or, or Ralph Nader or Cornell West, uh, all of them uh, for getting up and speaking an unpleasant truth have been pushed to the fringes of society. Uh, and, and I'm, you know, the liberal class is as is, is guilty, maybe even more guilty than that. Uh, stations like MSNBC, which are utterly subservient to the Democratic Party and uh, to the cult of Barack Obama, have kept those, those voices from us. So it's not just the right, it's the left uh, that are both trading in a kind of uh, false reality. Uh, and that's very dangerous because when you can't confront reality, when your society shuts out those voices that seek to describe uh, what reality is and how it works, um, then you can't talk about hope and you can't talk about change uh, because all hope and change is essentially uh, redirected into a dead political process or redirected into fantasy. I mean, the idea that, um, uh, you know, Barack Obama is going to save us from Wall Street or from the drone wars or uh, you know, from environmental degradation. Uh, it's a bit like, you know, all those poor prisoners in the gulag were writing letters to Uncle Joe Stalin. Um, and that is um, a symptomatic, and I think the United States would be uh, probably a good example of an empire in serious decay and decline. These are uh, qualities that are symptomatic of a society that can no, long, no longer has the intellectual and moral health uh, to face hard facts and readjust uh, and uh, carry out forms of self-criticism and self-correction. That was Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Chris Hedges. Be sure to tune in for part two of his interview tomorrow. And that's our show, you guys. Thanks for watching.